Good. So today uh, we have option. We have an option, I guess, and it depends how you guys feel. So the presentation from Ashley and Kirsten is next week. I'm assuming you want to do it on the Thursday. Is that right? Yeah, that would be preferred if, it, if it's next week. <laughs> okay. Um, do you know approximately how long it is right now? Um, we're both working on separate parts, so I'm not sure how long her part is right now, but we'll try to, we'll try to keep it within 30, 30 minutes ish. Yeah, 30 probably. to 45. Sure. Okay, cool. Let me expand. <laughs> um, okay. So the, the only other, and somebody will have to pass this on to Paul because otherwise he'll struggle. Um, the only other question, uh, the only other thing I want to say is on assignment four, if you haven't started the assignments yet, um, the new ones probably should because the exam will be like that. Um, question number four is not going to be asked because we did not cover C-glycoside synthesis this class. So not um, so. Question number four of assignment four is not going to be requested as one of the exam questions. Um, Samra, you should learn how to do that anyways for your research stuff. But uh, everyone else doesn't need to. All right, John, I'll do it. I've gone through every other question. No, every other question is legitimate. Um, I know they're challenging. It's kind of the point, but it's, it's a different way of evaluating. Um, still haven't marked the exams. If anyone wants me to mark their exam, I will immediately. Uh, if not, I'm going to wait and sort of see how the finals go. And then we can discuss if anyone wants to consider the midterm. I don't think it affects voluntary withdrawal dates. And I don't think anyone's going to need to voluntarily withdraw. I think everyone's going to be good and Get a good mark. Sorry, John. Um, do we have a date for the final yet? Um, no. When do you guys want to do it? Oh, we get to pick. Sure. I I, I don't care. There's five of us. Let, let whatever. April thirty second. Um, April thirty second <laughs> is not one of the optional dates. Fuck. I know. I'm really sorry. Um, Does it have to be during class time or it no, has it can to be, be at any time. So the final exam period in Windsor, like, so my, my only requirement is I need to be able to submit the, the marks by the deadline where I get start getting really bitchy emails from my Dean. And I don't want that. And I, I like, I want you guys to get the, the exam, the, the dates in good time. So if you do have any questions, we can go over that and adjust. Um, I'm trying to see when the winter exam period is. There we go, I think. Uh, April 12th to 22nd is the final exam period. So, um, I don't believe any, uh, are any of the grad students taking another class? Uh, Susanna uh, is. Yeah, Susanna is. I have an exam on the 12th. Okay, well that's the first uh, day of exams. Yeah. So Simone's being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's in the morning too. Like. <laughs> He gets up really early too. He could make it a six a.m. exam, and he, he'd still have been up for a couple of hours by then. Oh, um, I know. I answer his Slack messages at eight. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Kirsten and Ashley, what do you guys want? Do you? Uh, I don't know. So, Susanna doesn't want it on the twelfth. I'm assuming. Yeah. Unless you want to double down and get them all over with. Oh no! Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm open with it any time in the exam period. Um, yeah, I, I don't even, I think it's scheduled for the 
22nd. I don't know. I don't know how everyone feels. Either get it over with or do it later. I, um, I don't have a lot of exams either. I just have the one Susanna has and then one other one. So, okay. Chris, uh, Ashley, what's your opinion then? You might actually be our. Um, I have two other ones on the 15th and the 17th. So do you want to go or probably don't want to go earlier than I would think. No, I think I'm fine with it being after. <laughs> um, I'm. I'm happy with it being the 22nd. Okay. Does it, I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. That's when it's scheduled. I'm, I'm good with leaving it there. I'm good with moving it if anyone really wants to, but if everyone's pretty happy with that. I just have a question. Yeah, of course. If we do keep it the 22nd, it was scheduled from like seven to 10. Can we, we can at do least it any time? What time? time? Do do okay. It? Yeah, I'm, I'm good with moving it to like, we don't even need one of the exam slots. So, cause we don't, none of you guys have a conflict. I don't have a conflict. What I'd like to do is I'd like you guys to write the exam. I'd like to write, mark it on the 22nd and the 23rd and get it back to you. So you get your grades a day later. Uh, I would just get it done. So, and then what I'd also do is if the, if the final exam isn't looking super hot for anyone, I'd uh, go back and mark the midterm at that point too. Um, I don't really want to return the marks from the midterm, the reason I'm going to take a look at them, because the reason is if there's a question that was particularly poorly done on the midterm, I might put it again on the final. But if I return answers, that's kind of screws it up. So I can probably return a, a soft mark to you before that, if you like. Um, otherwise, yeah. I can kind of ignore it until I've taken a look at everyone's final. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to ask that. Do you think you could give me like a ballpark? Yeah, I can. Like I'll idea. go through and give a ballpark. I'll try and I'll get that to you guys by the um, the end of next week. Not the week after. I mean, next week is this. This is I'm in hell right now. So I yeah, will, it's all the end. Um, so I'll get I'll get you that by the ninth, probably earlier though. I just want to get it over with and get you guys a rough idea. So I'm you know what? Fuck it. I'll go through and mark them that week. Um, Can we also have the the due date for the review? The, a draft of it on the 22nd yeah uh i'm happy so when do i need to submit marks they'll probably start getting upset at me in i think i have seven days so i'm good with having it anywhere between the 22nd and the 29th for that Okay, that sounds good to me. Do you guys want to make the 29th? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> April yeah. is still a term, a uh, month of the term, right? So I'm fine with that. It will be a very rough draft <laughs> if it's any earlier. So. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's make it May 3rd. It's a Monday. Okay. You guys okay. didn't get the weekend to stew. <laughs> cool. Panic. Thank you. Does that work with everybody? Is that? Yeah, perfectly. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's fine with me as well. Okay. I'm just going to make a note. So, so what time do we want the exam on the 22nd? Uh, I don't know if, what other people's preferences are, but I'd rather do it like either around noon or like or something like do you want lunch do you want to have it before or after lunch like you can have like i can put it at noon you can have lunch at 11. um or you can have lunch while doing the exam i guess um yeah i mean that's that's fine with me <laughs> give it out like you know you can do that it's not going to take that long if you've done the questions already. It is completely appropriate if you've already done the questions for you to just take another look at them, scan them, and submit that. Uh, you don't need to rewrite out your answer if you've already solved these on your own. That's not cheating because you've already done the work. But let, let's say 12 to 4. 
Does that work that for everybody? Good. Sounds good. You even have time to drive to LCBO afterwards. Yeah, you have lots of time to drive to the LCBO. They're open until 10. That would have been a problem with the 7 to 10, I guess. Yeah, that's just, that's just evil. Yeah, okay, so 12 to 4. Um, paper May 3rd. And we'll make it midnight. I'll make it 11.59 p.m. Just so that there's a time. So ju just um, because I'm giving you the weekend, what I'd like you to also do with that is make sure that any references in the paper are in EndNote. You're, you're actually making uh, the reference prior to writing. Yeah, but just make sure they're formatted in EndNote when you put them into the paper. Okay. Because the reason for that isn't so much, and, and uh, in the ACS export format, uh, which isn't really hard to switch once you have them in EndNote. But um, the reason for that is it's going to make it easier to turn it around with later drafts. Okay. Um, so today, I think, so that's choice number one, was when is the exam, when is the paper, uh, when is the talk, so presentation. I'm just writing this down because that's all official and stuff. Um, is April 1st. So presentation April 1st, exam, full on review paper, which should be less rough. And I, I'm really hoping we don't need to do too much to turn that into a publication. Because, and hopefully it's gonna be just sort of thinking about the strategy, but all the content is there. We're not missing anything. We just need to think about how to rework it. Um, that's great. Okay. So today what we can do is we can either do, um, we talked about that already. Uh, cyclization. Or um, we can discuss the quick chemistry if everybody actually did homework and, and read that a little bit. Which would you guys prefer? I would prefer click chemistry. Okay. It's still fresh. Yeah. Okay. Any votes against that? I, I didn't read all of the papers, but I've, I read the, the first two that. Okay. No, yeah. they'll get started. I think. Okay. So we'll start with click. We'll come back to cyclization. Um, next week. Okay. Uh, and now I am going to put this into presentation mode. So What I want to try and do here, preferably, is actually walk through this class kind of in conversation, uh, much less like the lectures we've been having. I think the last class, the last day of classes is April 7th. Um, so we've got uh, three more classes after this. I think this might sort of take up two classes discussing bioconjugation and click. We'll have a class on the cyclization, then we'll have the um, the presentation class, which we might, I might try and squeeze in something else around there. I'm not exactly sure what, but so we can take sort of a class and a half to two classes to discuss these papers. I think this is, I, I like sugar chemistry. I like amino acid chemistry. It's something I'm interested in. It's something I think has a lot of value. I think it's important in medicinal development going forward. Um, Cool, fine. 
this I think is actually something that really click chemistry should be taught in the curriculum. It doesn't necessarily fit in here. It, it does kind of slide in because we are going to talk a lot about bioconjugation, but it's going to revolutionize chemistry in a way that really nothing else has. So just to go through this, I think that there's actually a lot of value to making sure that um, we're getting the point across. And so I really want to make sure that we're having a talk about this kind of concept. So let's start with um, what is click chemistry? So when I use that, what does that mean to y'all? I've been told I should use y'all more because it's gender neutral and plural and kind of informal. I'm not sure I buy that, but I'll try it out. So um, it has higher atom economy. High atom economy? Yep. Okay, I agree. Why is that important? Uh, makes uh, reactions cleaner and quicker, of course. It, uh, the longer steps we have, lower the uh, lower the atom economy is. Yeah, okay, so I agree. The more steps you have, the lower the atom economy for the entire process. But for a single step reaction, um, atom economy doesn't, affect the step count. Um, so cleaner, I like that. Why, why is high atom economy often clean? Um, reagents that we use are more precise and more workable, and there's less side products. I'll go with less side products. I disagree with you on the other com, like not necessarily, because I think that falls into something else. Mm -hmm. I am gonna go with less side products. That is equal to higher yield, I think. Well, I'm actually going to say less byproducts. It doesn't okay. necessarily create less side products. Um, often higher yield, I agree. What's the other benefit of good atom economy? Uh, there's less waste. Yeah, exactly. So it's greener, right? Yeah. There's, have you, has it, have any of you guys taken classes on green chem? I know we don't offer them really here, but I'm not sure if, uh, I think Dr. Drover is a, a very green chem guy, uh, and Simon to a little degree as well. So I don't know if that's offered any part of our curriculum. No, you know, Paul? Oh, I was just gonna say if it was, I would, I would want to take that. I think that's cool. <laughs> okay, you know what? Maybe we'll slide in that extra lecture. Maybe we'll talk about green chem. Um, okay, but less waste. So we've been talking a lot about the um, peptide synthesis and FMOC peptide synthesis. You don't get much less atom efficient than FMOC peptide synthesis. So when we say atom economy, what does that? What what's the definition of atom economy? What does it mean? It you don't need the, a textbook uh, definition, but um, it is the percentage of atoms converting from reactant to products. Yeah, I, I I love that. Now you can broaden this definition by including reagents as well. Uh, and even you can even go into saying, well, how much of the solvent gets incorporated into the products? Um, but this is this general idea. Okay, so high atom economy is essential for click chemistry. I agree. What's another component then? Um, high thermodynamic driving force. Yeah, so why is that important? Because it's like, to quote the one paper, it's like spring loaded to one product. Yeah. I like the term spring loaded. It's used a lot. So the idea here is that you have one 
major pathway that the molecule, the two molecules want to follow. And they're going to be massively downhill. And so it's massively thermodynamically favorable. And if one pathway is really, really thermodynamically favorable, you're going to really suppress the formation of any type of byproduct. You're also going to make that reaction very, very uh, spontaneous. It's going to go very fast. It's going to go to very high conversion. So high conversion is an important component of that. Often, this is low energy barrier, often, not always. Low byproducts. Okay, another component. Um, separation is easier. Yeah. Uh, I mean, collecting the product is easier. Isolation of product, let's say, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's better. Okay, so why is it important to have easy isolation of product? Like by by definition, it seems like it should be, but let's think about that for a second. Why it's important. Um, it's make the whole process less tedious, first of all, because... Uh, so let's say we don't care about the tediousness of the process. <laughs> okay, so like, we are we are we're the hardcore chemist. We are really into it. We don't care about how much time it would take. Well, time time. is something. Tediousness is something different from time. Okay, so let's not be lazy and time is, is good. All right. So it's time, time is money. I, all right, time is the time is money. So um, off like an easy isolation means it's going to take less time to do. Mm -hmm. Normally that translates into two things. It translates into less time of the operator. So if you're, um, I don't care if you're bored doing it, like mm -hmm. tedious. Um, columns uh, are there tedious. Is less, there is less, uh, there is less product uh, loss. Yes. Because again, time is operations. So the more time something takes, generally the more operations you're doing to it as well. No columns as well. Um, time is, so the fewer operations you conduct on a material, the less you lose. Actually, I'm going to, when we're going to do the green chemistry, we'll do a green chemistry thing with this. I'm also going to post a paper, I think, which I, I believe is probably the most important paper written for practical chemists. So I'll post that one as well. Um, but it talks about stuff like this. So time is money, so it's fast. Time is operations or yield is operations or time equals operations. I don't know, time equals yield equals operations. Higher yield. And less waste generally. And again, like, you know, there's a lot of, it's the pharma industry and the chemical industry have a really bad rap and we're all chemists. So, you know, we're kind of like, well, you can think about that a little bit. Green chemistry is not in opposition to this. It's not like no one wants to do green chemistry. Everybody wants to do green chemistry because they want to spend less money. Nobody wants to spend money. So if you can do things fast and easy, you do them fast and easy and you spend less money, you create less waste. Um, everything is better. So efficient chemistry is green chemistry. Okay, so isolation of product is easy. Completely agree. Uh, what's another aspect? Uh, Stereo specific? Sorry, yeah. Paul. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. All good. Yeah, okay. So that word, stereo specific, what, what does it mean? I think it was you, Kirsten, that, so you get to answer. Yeah, the, sorry, yeah. The, um, that uh, I guess only one or, or I guess an isomer is preferred over another or. Okay, so you use the word preferred. 
Yeah, I, I mean, you're writing down only one, so I'm assuming that was... <laughs> So one, one isomer possible okay. by mechanism. So stereoselective would be one isomer is preferred. Stereospecific is only one isomer possible by the mechanism. Got it. Uh, it like, yeah, it's angels on head of pin, but um, selective is based most, almost all reactions are stereoselective, like all uh, asymmetric catalysis generally is stereoselective. The SN2 reaction is stereospecific. You need inversion of configuration. Um, there is the co-directional SN2, which is kind of like the nucleophile comes in at the same side as the leaving group, which is very confusing. Um, except atoms are really small, so it kind of works, which retains configuration. But SN2s in general invert configuration. And so they're stereospecific because mechanistically it is the only possibility. Um, Whereas like a Noyori hydrogenation is asymmetric, 99% EE, it's really, really good, but it's only stereoselective because theoretically the other enantiomer is possible. Um, again, high yield because easy separation. Okay, a couple more I wanna have on this list. So the cold paper has, you know, um, that's a, I love that paper. It's a manifesto paper. It was basically these guys coming down saying, we are going to find a field and we're laying it out. We know we're about to make a, about to publish a major breakthrough, um, which was the azide alkyne reaction, which we're definitely coming to today. But where we want to lay out the groundwork of this field first. Uh, so they got almost everything in there, but I think there's a few other things that we need to consider to add to the click. So uh, what other aspects? Um, easy to use starting materials. Yeah. So how would you define easy to use? Um, like, I guess, bench stable and semi non-toxic. <laughs> bench stable, cheap, oh. yeah. Non-toxic. All good. Uh, readily accessible. Okay. There was uh, this interesting approach that the sharp list they gave that there is no need for the chemist to design complex molecules, but should focus on the molecules that have the, that deliver the function and are easy to make. Right, and actually, so um, I, I I have a philosophical disagreement with him, but yes, I see his point. Um, it is about function. Like, if you can get function on simple molecules, you should. I think you can't always get function on simple molecules, and maybe that, that's where I, I, I divide. But never make a molecule more complicated than you need to. Um, and I think that's the case. I'm not sure if that's so much a uh, principle of click chemistry, though. Let's just make sure that this is absolutely explicit. High yield is important. Um, I'd say another factor that's really important is no need for customized conditions. for different substrates. So ideally what you want is you want your molecule, uh, like this functional group to basically do that chemistry regardless of what it's attached to. Like if you're talking, if we go back to the azide alkyne example, um, you don't really care what else is attached to that azide. It could be a peptide, it could be a benzyl group, it could be a sugar, it could be a silicon nanoparticle, silicon nanoparticle. I don't think there are silicon, you know, part silicone, whatever. Um, same with the alkyne. It doesn't matter what that alkyne is attached to. It's irrelevant. 
because it's just it's all about the functional group and that's really unusual in chemistry like we've been looking at the sugars and you know depending on what's what's over on c4 that affects what's going on at the anomeric position or you know if the moon is retrograde in jupiter that affects your reaction uh, it's nice to have something where it doesn't freaking matter if there's a nuclear bomb going outside the door. If you have an azide and an alkyne, they are going to click together to give you a triazole. So no need for customized conditions for different substrates is really central for this because that allows you to quickly make different molecules without having to customize every single one. And I think the other big one that I keep remembering and forgetting as I'm talking, and it's going to come back to me, uh, oh yeah, I'm just going to call it orthogonality. What I mean by that is the reactive moieties, and by moiety I mean like piece, bit, chunk, functional group, don't react with anything else. Like carbocations satisfy almost all these conditions, except for the whole ease of bench stable thing, but incredibly thermodynamically favorable. Um, not so much stereo specific because they're a carbocation, but that's okay. Really high yields if you can get them to be controlled with one nucleophile and stuff. Um, the problem is that they react with freaking everything. So, you know, you can't carry a carbocation through multiple reaction steps and then do the chemistry with it. That just doesn't work. It, it reacts immediately. So what you ideally want are functional groups that don't react with anything else. And so this orthogonality is really, really important. When you step back from this list, it's kind of clear that this is like a dream wish list of what all reactions would be. And wouldn't it be wonderful if every reaction, you never need to customize conditions ever again, and everything went in 100% yield, and everything crystallized out of the um, the reaction mixture. Um, like I think this isn't in the paper. I, I don't think they cite this statement. It's made by it was made by a process chemist in the 1960s, and he said that the ideal reaction is one which can be run in a bathtub by a blind one-handed chemist. And the product is isolated by simply removing the plug and draining out the water. And because it's done in water, because it's ideal. And the product just crystallizes out. Um, that's, there are not a lot of reactions where your, rea your product crystallizes out of your reaction mixture and all you need to do is filter. But ideally, that's what you're aiming towards. And that will be the ideal isolation. Sounds more like a magic trick. Yeah. It is. Uh, there are there are actually some reactions which are really cool because you can do some deals alder reactions where you use one of the components as the solvent, and it slowly crystallizes everything. Uh, we actually I do one in my group and it's just magical because at the end all you do is you take the entire flask, you grab a spatula, you stir it around a bit. Everything is the whole thing is turned to crystal from liquid. And you pour put into a filtration funnel and you apply a little vacuum, gets rid of a little bit of stuff that didn't react. Um, but about 99% of what's in the flask is turned into your product. And so that's really, really cool. So when we think about this, we think about what reactions satisfy these conditions. So um, the one I'm going to come to talk about briefly first, just make sure we touch on it. Copper catalyzed. Azide. Alkyne. Cycloaddition. So sometimes this is, you know what, assisted is what I always call it, because it sounds better. 
because then the abbreviation is quack, which I love. So um, this was discovered that, well, I'm not sure when it was discovered at two, it was discovered by two, two different groups about the same time, Sharpless and Meldahl. 2002. What's really cool is Meldahl is actually at the Carlsberg Institute in Denmark, which is funded by the Carlsberg Brewery. All the research done there, it's fundamental chemistry, is funded by beer sales. And that's just because the, the original owners of Carlsberg liked chemistry and we're thinking, let's, let's fund some original discovery research in chemistry. And so to this day, every Carlsberg beer, a little bit of the money goes towards just supporting fundamental discovery chemistry. And you come up with things like discovering this reaction. I, they actually do a lot of sugar chemistry there because Carlsberg is, yes, they're funding just fundamental discovery chemistry, but it never hurts to do something that the brewery might be a little bit interested in. So it is really sweet because it's sugar chemistry. So this, um, there's two different sets of conditions this, uh, by both of these people, but they're fundamentally the same. Let's take any terminal alkyne, any terminal azide, treat that with copper one. And you get a triazole. So this reaction is close to my heart because I was doing a lot of chemistry on this in about 2005, 2000 to about 2010, when it was still relatively new. And not a lot of stuff had been done. Um, solvent. What's really good about this reaction is it really doesn't matter what the solvent is. Um, I did an experiment. I did a series of experiments, which my boss told me was stupid. Uh, I really like whiskey. I love whiskey. So I have a huge whiskey cat collection. I And I did as a grad student too, because I spent all my sweet, sweet NSERC graduate stipend on whiskey. And I took a few milliliters of all my whiskeys and some vodkas and some gins. And I ran this reaction in those solvents. And it doesn't matter because whiskey, vodka, gin, a lot of the time that would screw up reactions because there are alkaloids in there. There's all these um, colored molecules which bind to things. There's water, there's ethanol, but essentially all, all spirits are 60, 40 water ethanol mixtures. And these click reactions went, these quack reactions went like 95% yield regardless of anything. So I wrote the whole thing up and got, like said, let's submit this to a journal. And my boss was like, no, we're not doing that. That's really stupid. And then two years ago, uh, two years later, somebody submitted it, something really, really similar to the, one of the top journals in the field, just because it's really cool that you can run this reaction in whiskey. And I'm not bitter about that at all. But it was just, you can do it. It's, it's great. Like the reaction really, really works. So there's two different options. You can use an aqueous mixture. Um, I have a paper on this. It works best about nine to one organic water, but it doesn't really matter. You know, we're talking 10% yields differently. Yeah, exactly. Good job, Paul. Um, and if you do this, what you normally do is you use copper sulfate, which for those sharp eyed people out there is copper two. but copper one is the catalyst. So you add sodium ascorbate, which is vitamin C. What that does is it reduces the copper two down to copper one. And you add an excess of sodium ascorbate. Uh, normally, normally the conditions for this would be one to one to 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 ascorbate. There's an excess of ascorbate. The reason for that is because the copper is constantly going back to copper two because it's in water and ethanol. 
and it constantly oxidizes because everything oxidizes and copper one's not very stable. So you do need to have an excess of this. It's a reducing agent. Again, doesn't matter what solvent it is. Like you could basically just write down freaking anything and it would work. The other condition is you can do this in pure organic. And then you can use a copper one salt. Uh, copper one bromide works okay. You add, mod, The modern root, root uses a much more complex ligand on the copper, which really stabilizes it and makes sure that it doesn't oxidize back to copper two. But copper one bromide works fine in organic conditions. And again, it doesn't really matter what solvent you use. THF, DCM, hexanes, DMF. Notice that they're all just aprotic and that, because the, the aprotic nature. Keeps oxidation away. Always good to degas. Just to get any oxygen out of your mixture. Because if you have any oxygen there, it's going to destroy your catalyst. Not that you care very much. Copper one's pretty cheap, so you just you know pour more in, but still. So I'm going to skip back a slide because I missed one point on that I want to have for the click chemistry. Ideally, you want these reactions to happen at room temperature. Reason for that is cooling takes energy, heating takes energy. Um, and so what this means actually is you want a really, really fast reaction, thermodynamically super stable and favorable, but not too, too favorable because you don't want it to explode when you put the two things together. So, and you could prevent that by really cooling it down, but you don't really want to cool it down because that takes energy. So ideally you want a reaction that's really, really selective, each partner for each other and nothing else, but isn't too fast because you don't want it to go exothermic and blow up on you because blowing things up is not green or clicky. Uh, your atom economy is normally quite poor in an explosion. Things are turn, tend to turn into carbon dioxide. So we want to avoid explosions. So, um, which takes us into the, the one place where this can be a little bit dangerous. So let's think about the mechanism for this. Does anyone, again, does anyone know the mechanism for this? So you've got copper, you've got an azide and an alkyne. Now, if you don't have copper and you just have the azide and the alkyne, they will form a triazole, but you normally need to heat them to about 230, 240 degrees Celsius. And that's called a Huygens cycle addition. Uncatalyzes the Huygens. Um, he's still alive or he was until really, no, I think he died last year. Uh, but he discovered this back, I think in the forties or fifties. So the copper plays a role. It's a catalyst. It's got to do something. Any guesses? Uh, does it, does the copper coordinate with the alkene yeah with the alkyne yeah or that's why i meant yeah sorry yeah and that's exactly what we get so we get the copper coordinating with the alkyne so if you know a lot about alkyne copper chemistry 
This is also the first step of the Sonnegashira reaction. It's very, very similar. And what you've just done is you've made this proton really, really, really acidic. Like, I can take it off with triethylamine acidic. And that's because the copper has taken electrons from the alkyne. So it would not be inaccurate. Okay, it would not be that inaccurate. To think of it as that. Now, the reason I'm putting copper there is because I'm putting the carbocation on a more stable carbon. So that's where I'm getting the delta plus. It's the more substituted carbon. You're going to have a greater um, positive charge on there. Now, of course, it doesn't quite make a sigma bond. It's not a single bond, blah, blah, blah. But I'm an organic chemist. I'm simple. We're going to do it this way. Now, there's... I'm going, to draw, I'm going to draw the simplified mechanism. The, this mechanism has been partially debunked. This reaction is second order with respect to copper. And there is another copper atom that's involved. But you, you can explain the reactivity this way. And there's actually, if, if you really love mechanism, uh, it's just, it's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do in this course. So it's not really that important because it's really getting into details of orbitals and stuff. Um, there's a really good um, chem your J and if you want it, I'll send it to you, but it's not part of this course. Um, it's a good read, a really good mechanistic study of somebody really taking this reaction apart and looking at what happens. So if we think about the azide, you've got a resonance structure of that. where we have that guy. This one's more favorable. We have the negative charge on a less substituted nitrogen. They're both, um, it's also on an SP nitrogen, whereas the other nitrogen is SP2. And having a negative charge on sp atom is always better than having it on an sp2 atom. So you've got the delta and minus on here. You have the delta plus here. That explains the regiochemistry you observe, where the terminal nitrogen attacks the carbon that's adjacent to the R group. We get this happening. And I'm missing a charge. Um, still positive. That, of course, isn't going to last very long. The copper is just going to dissociate, and the electrons in the copper or carbon bond are going to leave. And we generate the triazole. So, you know, it's, it's really not that tricky mechanistically. Um, you can almost leave the copper out and just draw the, the arrows going pericyclic and it's fine. It works. Um, the copper does get involved and it does accelerate the reaction. This is how it does it. So the one caution with this reaction 
And I just feel the need to say this every time. Small azides are really explosive. As a rule of thumb, or a rule to keep thumbs, um, you want two times as many non N atoms in an azide molecule. Non-N heavy atoms. So not, not hydrogen. Nobody cares about hydrogen. So that's why something like this, anybody ever asks you to work with this methyl azide, please run the other way. because it's only got one non-nitrogen heavy atom on it. So it's three to one the wrong way. Um, bad news. Really, you don't, what this is basically saying is don't get too much smaller than benzyl azide. There are a few exceptions. Alcohol azides seem to be particularly stable. So I've actually distilled this on like kilogram scale. But even that would eventually probably detonate if I heated it enough. Um, just be careful with azides. Uh, yeah, reliability, I would agree, Samra. Reliability would be a, um, a good factor to add to the click reaction. So you can add that back to your notes. Um, just on this note, actually, we uh, just as an example of this, things to think about when you're making these kind of molecules is a few years ago a student and i made this molecule so it's an internal it's sort of self-clicking because you got an azide and all kind of same molecule unfortunately it's really explosive <laughs> Um, and that's because this molecule, if you're thinking about what an azide really wants to do, I don't know if this is really relevant to the course, but it's just, you know, things to think about, is it wants to break that bond and make nitrogen gas. Sorry, I'm just going to move this. It wouldn't mind breaking this bond and making methylamine, which is a gas. And it wouldn't mind breaking this bond, making carbon dioxide, which is a gas. So you have three gases in one molecule. When liquid molecules can become gases, bad things can happen because suddenly you have volume expansion because a gas takes up a lot more space than a liquid. And normally it's very entropically favored. And so it's often exothermic to do that. And so when one molecule decides to spontaneously become three gas molecules, it releases a lot of heat, which encourages all the other molecules that this is a really good idea to suddenly become gas molecules. And then suddenly all your liquid is becoming a gas molecules and that's an explosion. So we did, I, I blew myself up with this molecule.
Uh, it does pass the rule. There's enough non nitrogen molecules in there that should be okay. But you have to, I should have considered the other functional groups that are present in the molecule and how that can decompose into gas. So please be careful when you're designing really cool novel molecules that you're not suddenly making things that are all gaseous. This molecule, we're still handling it. It's safe to handle uh, if you don't distill it and heat it, which we do not anymore. What was, what was the third gas, John? Just out of curiosity. Carbon dioxide, methylamine, and nitrogen gas. Okay. Yeah. That's going to grab some protons from somewhere, become methylamine. It's not going to be too picky. Anyways, sidebar, completely unrelated to the course material, really, but just uh, something to always consider when you're thinking about these kinds of systems. So this is a really general reaction. It works for almost everything. The other thing that's really good about it is that azides are basically insensitive to almost, like when they're not exploding, uh, they don't do anything. Like there are no azides. Okay, I'm sure there's some azide in nature. I'm sure some weird ass fungus uh, has an azide as a and it's not a natural product. But you know, there's no azides in in all the macromolecules. Um, there are also no alkynes really in nature. Again, there are some natural products with alkynes in them, but they're very very rare. So azides and alkynes aren't very common. So the original thought on a lot of this and where this got really, really exciting was people went, well, what we can do is we can take a protein. That's a protein. And somewhere on this protein, we can attach an azide or an alkyne. Okay. So it's a protein. Let's say this is a hundred kilodaltons. Way too big to make using peptide synthesis. You need to use bacteria to make this. Let's say we want to attach an azide or an alkyne. Doesn't matter either one to the protein. How would you go about doing it? And what would be the problems that you would consider uh, with that? Like, what are the problems with doing it that way? So basically, how do you functionalize a protein? Um. I guess just like conceptually, you need to know like what residues are like on the outside. Yeah, consider that you got everything. You okay. got them all. It's a big protein. Um, John, can you please elaborate on what you mean by functionalize? Uh, you want to attach an you want to attach an azide group or an alkyne group to it. So you got a protein, it's, it's, it's got like it's 20 amino acids. None of the natural 20 amino acids have azides or alkynes. So we want, we want to add an azide or an alkyne to it. How would you go about doing that? I think making alkyne is uh, for the, um, from the amino, we can make azide. For an amino, you can make an azide. Have, yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe from a, do we have ethyl? Mm. Oh, we can Are, make alkynes with the organometallics. Oh. Yeah, you can make an alkyne with organometallics. I, I, I agree with you in principle on both of those things. I don't think it's necessarily the great. So how do you make, do you know how you make an azide from an alkyne, from an amine? If you don't, that's fine. Um, uh, after nitration. Um, I think we oxidize the amino, convert it into nitro group, and then you make azide. Um, maybe I'm no, I'm not sure. I'm mixing. I don't. Them. I don't. 
I don't think that would work. Um, you can get a diazo compound that way, but not an azide. Uh, azides you often make through diazo transfer, so you actually move an N2 group onto an amine. Um, so what you, it, it's actually really kind of cool chemistry, just let's, because this is actually one way to do it. I, I, I agree that this is possible. So if we take lysine, I think we can do it also do it with hydrazine. Uh yes. Um with an amine. Yes, you can with hydrazine triflate. Um this is actually kind of the same kind of idea, but safer. <laughs> sort of. So you take that, you take something you make in situ, which is triflic azide. My pen's acting a little funny. So it's just, I'm just going to draw out triflic azide. So if we have that molecule, um, we can essentially transfer the azide group over. Temporarily, we're gonna have an N2 minus actually on that, which is really weird, but that's gonna protonate out really quickly. And it's because you've got this really good leaving group on here, sucking electron density out. Generally, this is done in water. And so you're never really getting N2 minus, you kind of have a hydrogen bond forming. So I'm just gonna put this in back. plus what's called a zitolysine. So yeah, you can do this. This is great. I think we're overthinking the other one a bit too much though. So if we want to put an alkyne on that, what I would do is I would take, just take a linker. Like it's no longer lysine. It's now got an a, it's now got an amide up there, but you've installed the the alkyne. Um, what other amino acids would be suitable for this kind of chemistry using like an electrophilic linker like this besides lysine? Glycine. Glycine, you said? Yep. I disagree. There's no nucleophile in glycine. You need a nucleophile. Lysine's got that nitrogen. Proline? Um, proline has its nitrogen tied up in the amide bond. If it's in that, if it's, because consider that they're all in a protein, right? So you need a side chain nucleophile. Gotcha. The thionine or threonine or? I go, I like serine. Work. Serine? Did you say threonine? Threonine, you said, right? Yep. Yeah, I agree. Threonine. Methionine is interesting. It theoretically can, but methionine has that thio ether, right? So the sulfur is nucleophilic, but it's already sulfur too. So I'm just going to swap it out for cysteine. And I think, and then we have lysine. And then in an emergency, you've got glutamic acid. You'd want to use a different type you probably wouldn't want to have a uh, acid chloride. You probably want like just a alkyl chloride for that aspartic acid. Theoretically, uh, if you don't mind a positively charged nitrogen, which is okay, like we get that in arginine, um, for really hot electrophiles, Oops, we missed um, we missed tyrosine. You can use histidine or 
Power Trip Fan. At this point, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Like that's almost half the amino acids can be modified in this kind of way pretty readily. Okay. So what's the problem with this approach? Like either a Zitto translate showed or this kind of alkyne thing or any kind of linker thing. What's the issue we've got? It's not selective. Yeah, course. it's not selective, right? You're just going to dump this. You're just going to like basically dump this in, hope for the best that some nucleophile is going to do it. And you hope that that nucleophile isn't important for the protein function. Because if you need that OH or that SH or that NH, if you don't have it, the damn thing unfolds or it doesn't interact with this target or something like that, you're fucked, right? Because you just, just destroyed your protein from doing what you probably want it to do. So, um, uh, scripts, the oh, yeah. So Brian Stoltz at Scripps La Jolla, which is in San Diego. The, um, it's like the dream place to do, well, okay, it's both the dream and nightmare places to do research. All the professors there are assholes, but the, um, the research site overlooks a beach, which is really easy to go down and go surfing on. And it's San Diego, so it's warm all the time. And it's a beautiful city. But Everyone there is an asshole. Anyways, including this guy. But he did something really, really clever. And so he went, well, this is great. We all want to do this. But what's the, we have this selectivity issue. So if they thought, well, what if we could solve the selectivity issue? What if I want the, they went with an azide. We'll, we'll see why. Um, what if I want to install the azide specifically only on one residue of the protein and not touch any other residue of the protein? That's the problem. How, how would you think about doing that? Like conceptually? Just rephrase the question. Let's say I have a protein and I want to install an alanine at a given site and it doesn't have alanine in it. Like uh, at that site, the site is, I don't know, glycine, but I want to put an alanine in there. Um, again, again, we do a, something like this, like instead of putting the functionalizing the protein, I functionalize a separate residue and okay. then attach it to the protein. Uh, yeah, you could modify that, but now the problem is what if there's like lots and lots of other glycines, so you can't specifically modify only that one. Um, like the glycine, okay. let's say your glycine is in the middle of your molecule protein, like middle of the chain, and you want to make it an alanine. Um, no, I was, uh, I was trying to say that if I have a separate amino acid, I attach it with the alkyne. And that amino acid, I attach it with the protein, something terminally, I'm sure. So on a terminus? Yeah. Uh, that works. What if you want to put it in the middle? You don't want it on a terminus. Okay. That's not a bad idea. Terminal functionalization is a strategy. The problem with terminal functionalization is the, en the edges of proteins are still acids and amines. And that means that you're the terminal amine is always going to compete with any lysine residue and it's going to lose. Lysine is a primary amine, so it's going to be a lot more nucleophilic than the secondary amine at the end of the protein. And there's often a lot more lysines and ends of proteins. And you have the same problem with the carboxylic acid and all the glutamic acids and the aspartic acids. It would be really nice if proteins had things other than amines and carboxylic acids at their ends. 
but they don't, they do. Can we protect? I love the way you're thinking. And what I'm gonna say is you're thinking like a chemist and it's the wrong way to think. So- Do I need to think like a biologist? Yeah, I think you need to think like a biologist. So if I wanna put alanine in for glycine, I know all you guys are taking like basic bio biochemistry classes. So you can use site directed mutagenesis. Change the DNA, right? Uh, we've been talking a lot about synthetic peptide stuff. Awesome, really, really cool to do that. But if you're making a protein, the peptide chemistry is not going to work. You're going to use bacteria or cells to do that, generally. Um, through the plasmids, I guess. Yeah, you, exactly. You take you you clone a gene into a plasmid. You do a site. You then try and duplicate the plasmid. And you use primers that have the single error in them. Like you change the code, so that you switch from one coded amino acid to another coded amino acid. So this is site direct immunogenesis, change the DNA, allows you to change the peptide sequence. Okay, great. Uh, doesn't really help though, because the DNA codes the 20 natural amino acids. So this is where this just feels kind of futuristic. So you might know that, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. I think there are four stop codons, like four combinations of nucleic acids, which do not have a tRNA match for them. So when the gene gets to those combinations, it can't add another amino acid and it just stops and it releases the protein. The protein transcription is done. So what they did is they designed a new tRNA which transports azitolysine. And if you remember how tRNA works, you have your ribosome, it's growing its protein along there, it's making the mRNA, uh, sorry, no, it's, it's taking in mRNA and it's finding tRNAs that are kind of coming in. They're binding to the mRNA because they match over three different amino nucleic acids and they have an amino acid attached to them and they transfer the amino acid to the growing peptide train. Your ribosome is your basically your solid phase peptide synthesizer of the cell. And it actually kind of is solid phase because ribosomes are huge. Like, so what the Stoltz group did is they designed a new tRNA for one of the stop codons that doesn't have a tRNA that reacts with it in anywhere in the cell. And they preloaded that tRNA with azitolysine um, because it was a step too far to kind of get the cell to load the tRNA with the azitolysine. And because the cell has no way to make azitolysine, so it's not really all that great. And so when the ribosome is going along making these proteins and it runs into what was normally a stop codon, instead of not being able to find a tRNA, it finds the right tRNA and it has an azitolysine. And so it's able to encode the azitolysine and incorporate it into the protein and then continue building the rest of the protein. So we can now add unnatural amino acids using customized tRNAs. So we're hijacking the cells 
protein synthetic machinery to make to incorporate unnatural residues into proteins. Um, there aren't very many at this point. I think I think I can still count them on two hands, the number that have been coded. But that was a few years ago. It's probably been exponential growth, and people have probably done a lot of things with that. Um, frankly, this blows my mind. Like this, this is kind of playing God. And um, I'm not I'm not a religious person, so I don't I, that, that doesn't bother me per se. But it's it doesn't have a ne necessarily a negative connotation. But it's just we're working at such a basic level here, we're kind of cheating. And I think this is one of the most important innovations out there. Okay, so you can make a protein that has an azine on it. So that problem was solved. The next problem is what if I want to label that? So I want to attach an alkyne to it. And let's say my alkyne has, you know, a dye. The reason that like it's flashy, we can blow it up with fluorescence and we can see it. We can sort of track where things are because we can now attach a dye to this protein. We can watch wherever this protein is going. So if we add a drug to this, well, to this thing, we can sort of follow what happens with the protein and how much of this protein is being made and where's the protein going and when's it being degraded and is it leaving the cell and if it leaves the cell where does it go you can do all sorts of things because we can now use this azide to attach a dye to this thing this is great if you isolate the protein and you have isolated protein sitting in a flask you add the dye stir it all together add some copper you're done this doesn't work great if you want to do what i just said which is i want to follow the protein in vivo like in a living cell. And that's because copper is toxic. So I do my click reaction. I mix my a, my protein with an azide in it and stick the alkyne in there and add it into the cells and add some copper and all my cells die. So my experiment's kind of a failure. So to solve this problem, Um, she was at MIT, I think, and now she's at Stanford. And what she discovered, well, she didn't discover it. It's just, she's really smart. So I don't know if you remember second year chemistry. Well, but cyclooctynes... Smallest ring with an alkyne. Not a happy alkyne. And what she realized, I, I, this is one of those moments in like scientific history that I kind of wish I'd been around where she thought of this idea because it probably was like a light bulb going off just boom you saw this is that there's so much ring strain on that alkyne uh like if you try and build a model of a cyclooctyne it's you can't get 180 degrees on that triple bond that triple bond it's bent as soon as it's bent there's a lot of energy in there it doesn't really want to be a triple bond so suddenly if you bring this guy close to an azide no catalyst it just goes it just works like what i was saying was with the click chemistry with the copper you need that terminal alkyne i'm it doesn't work with internal alkynes with the copper catalysis and it's because you kind of can make that really acidic H plus, which can kind of leave, which can have the copper join. You can generate everything. It's all kind of happy, but you don't need copper here. So this works with the terminal alkyne just fine. And that system is so strained. 
it's so spring loaded coming back to what Paul was saying that it doesn't need any encouragement. You take any cyclooctine, you give it the whiff of an azide and it immediately forms a triazole. Now you have no need of the copper catalyst. So now you can do this in live cells and this, um, I'm waiting for this to win a Nobel Prize. It, it's got to win a Nobel Prize. She really freaking deserves it. This is brilliant. And everybody's just been actually kind of jumping on this bandwagon over the last 10 years. I want to say this is about 2010. Um, and this has just changed everything about, there's dope on there, everything about how we can go about doing all sorts of cell biology and labeling things. And it comes from, you know, fundamental synthetic organic chemistry. We're at 521. I think I'm going to let Carolyn uh, rule the roost for this class. Next class, I think we'll talk a little bit more about some of the more, some more of the click chemistry. Um, what I'd love is that if you guys read the papers, I'm going to start by just, I want to touch on two other reactions and I want to just like open the floor and we can discuss this stuff. Take a look at assignment five over the weekend because it has a question that involves click chemistry and sort of using it to design orthogonal uh, preparations of molecules. And so I think it's the last question on there. And think about that. Think about what you read with these things. And then I'm really happy to discuss this kind of chemistry. That's really cool. Okay. Uh, John, I had a, a question about like the, the, the mechanism. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of, I, I don't really understand like when metals coordinate to carbon carbon bonds. I don't really like, that. just kind of scary to me. Yeah. It's scary to me too. So oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're on the same page here. So let's think about the, let's think about the triple bond. Okay, triple bond. So if we draw on the electrons at any, you know, it's not an inaccurate way to describe it this way with an electron each lobe. But of course, this is in complete resonance with a form where we've got two electrons over in this lobe. And again, I'm drawing linear combinations of atomic orbitals here, right? This is not a true representation of the molecular orbital, but it'll work as a model. This, of course, can be represented like it's a little bit of a stupid resonance structure. I'm just going to put hydrogen over here too. But it's a resonance structure of an alkyne, right? You, you're with me, Paul? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. So if you have copper plus, think of it as H plus, you know, it's plus. And the difference being that H plus, you really need like a C minus, something like this to interact with it. The copper plus is really interacting with the electron cloud. I'm just going to draw one of the pi bonds because I haven't yet figured out how I, I suck at 3D drawing and the other one will be kind of masking this whole thing and sort of sitting in front of it and it'll be difficult to draw. But you have big delta minuses on both of these clouds because it's freaking electrons up there. And copper, unlike hydrogen, is really soft. It doesn't need... The orbit, it doesn't need a distinct pair of electrons to interact with the copper atom. 
so if we talk about hard and soft, and I know we talked about this in the third year class, um, a hard, hard system is basically you are making or ionic bonds or covalent bonds. Electrons are definitely being shared. Direct orbital bond overlap thingies. Whereas soft is much more acting through the molecular orbitals and the frontier molecular orbital interactions of the sigma star and the sigma bond of the molecular orbital interacting rather than the atomic orbitals. This is an oversimplification, but hard is like atomic orbitals interacting, soft is like molecular orbitals interacting. Copper is pretty soft. So it kind of shows affinity for the electron cloud sitting of that dull bond. Okay, um, sure. Now, we often represent that, and I represented it in, in the lecture notes as just, you know, copper interacting with the triple bond. That's an accurate representation of what's happening. It's also pretty freaking useless. So one thing we can think about there is this, as we know, was a resonant structure of that. Like, it's the same thing. I'm just drawing it differently. And as an organic chemist, I'm a lot more comfortable drawing covalent bonds. So I'm going to shuffle. I'm going to say that is effectively a resonance structure. Um, Dr. Drover would skin me alive for this. He's not here. Um, Okay, it's a resonance structure, so I can't move atoms, and I just did. Atoms go back. So we can effectively draw kind of a resonance structure of this. And so, but this is also, I should probably draw it over like that. resonance structure of that. So the copper is kind of flipping back and forth between the two carbons. So if you think about like an epo uh, like a bromonium ion, you've got carbon, carbon, bromine making a triangle. Uh, the carbon, carbon double bond is attacked to Br plus, and now suddenly we have a triangle here. Um, you've got two electrons spread between three atoms. We kind of have the same thing here. We have two electrons spread between three atoms. We still have two electrons sitting there in an alkene, but we've kind of lost the triple bond of the alkyne and it's interacting with the copper and both of the carbons. Either way, what we've just done is we've increased the electrophilicity of the carbons because we've donated electron density to the copper. And so the copper associating with the, with the triple bond, what it's really doing, the, the verb is almost wrong there. It's almost like the triple bond is associating with the copper, like the, triple, the electron flow is from the triple bond to the copper. And so we're donating electron density out of the pi system to this metal. The metal is not making a covalent bond with either one, but we can represent it as this kind of resonance thing I've drawn here, where the copper is kind of associated with both carbons at different time. Well, it's the same time as resonance. It's not switching. It's all the same thing. Um, but what we've done is we've generated a positive charge on the carbons. You see the same kind of chemistry with gold and silver, um, with palladium. It's the same kind of idea. I have no idea if that helped. Oh, yeah, that was actually really helpful. I, I remember um, at some of the earlier Orgo meetings with Dr. Green, like there was some like gold chemistry like this. And I think someone was doing it. And I just didn't have any idea what was going on. So yeah, it was helpful. Like, I think the thing to think about is every double bond is the same thing as a carbanion and a carbocation right next to each other. Okay, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, John, do you have a minute? Sure. Yeah, um, so I think if everyone else is done, I'm going to stop recording.